So this breakout session is a whole new world, AR, VR, and IoT in the utility space. And we're going to be talking about how deploying AR and VR is going to help transform training, maintenance, and field operations for organizations, particularly utilities. And so with me today to talk about this, we have Maged Yacoub, uh, who focuses on OT and innovation at Alexicon Energy, Carol Johnson, the VP of Marketing at Clevist, and Roger Skidmore, CEO and founder of EDX Technology. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Karen. So while we get into this conversation, to kick things off, I think a lot of the time right now, especially when it comes to emerging technologies and understanding what they are, particularly, particularly around AR and VR, there is some confusion around the difference between those two technologies. So to start, can someone explain really the difference between AR and VR technology? Sure, I'll take that. Um, I have a very liberal definition of, of virtual reality and augmented reality. So virtual reality fundamentally is where everything that's in view, everything the user is experiencing is completely generated by the computer. So most people view that today in terms of almost every computer software you use today is completely drawn on the computer by the computer. The graphics are totally generated. Uh, in, I guess in, in contrast, augmented reality is where there's some real world view involved. You're actually adding content over top of a, a current live view or a, a physical view of the real world in some form or fashion. And so with that as a, uh, as a starting point, there's the all different flavors of augmented reality that you can actually trigger and, and deal with. Everything from pointing your phone at a QR code and getting something that appears on your screen to, to simply walking around and, and panning around with your device to, to experience content that is positionally located and oriented properly in space in some form or fashion. So I won't would take too much time in terms of, of talking about all different ways of triggering or experiencing augmented reality. Just take away that there's about as many different flavors of triggering and, and accessing augmented reality content as, as you can imagine that there could be today. So to give through a, a simple example um, that may relate to people in this room, you already have access to a, a big pile of information that you've captured or in the process of capturing about your utility networks today. Uh, where are all your assets? Where are all your people? What are they doing? What are your work tasks that are being assigned? How are you going about managing all the different uh, expansions to your network or reconfiguring things in your network or dealing with outages and things of that nature? Most all of the information has some form of positionable or actionable component to it meaning it's got a location or it's got an, an action assigned to it. And that's really all you need to begin looking at taking the information and putting it into an augmented reality or a virtual reality type of context. So if you, you think about how you would take the information and how you typically experience it today, most people in this room are probably familiar with taking information that you have and viewing it on a, a map. So taking it where are my assets located? Oh, it's at the street corner. I can see it from a top-down view on a map. Anything that's viewable on a map could also be experienced in a different format. So if you take that same type of information and you add, say, a third dimension to it, so you've got the map information. If you have elevation data or things like that, which is readily available today in most contexts, you can begin forming a virtual model of the space. So instead of necessarily restricting yourself to a top-down view, suddenly you can have more of a first-person view, or at least a third-person view that's rotated in some form or fashion to view the area in that context. And then if you take that information you started with, asset information, equipment information, personnel information, and overlay that, incorporate that into that virtual model you've created, well, that actually creates almost a virtual reality interpretation of that space. At that point, you have a fully um, <coughs> virtual model of the space that you can interact with, the third dimension adds context to all the assets and equipment and adds basically the ability of, of conveying more information than you can typically get just from a top-down view. Now with augmented reality, essentially you're back to a, a live view or a real-world view of the physical space in some form or fashion. And that contrasts with the virtual model view, but they're, they should be relatively the same. The virtual model view is all computer generated for a space, augmented reality, the real-world view some form of image or capture image or a live view of the space is available to you. Take the same information that was in the virtual model, asset information, configuration information, current workflow statuses, things of that nature, incorporate that into the live view, and this meets the definition of augmented reality. 
So to compare and contrast the two, essentially back to the beginning, virtual reality, entirely computer generated content, augmented reality, computer generated content, but overlaid onto or in somehow incorporated into a current real world view of the physical space. Thank you, Roger. And so now that we have a better understanding of the differences of these technologies, let's talk about some of the pilots that you guys are, are seeing in the marketplace. What pilots are you seeing using this technology? Yeah, I can take that. So we spent about the last year looking at different uses of some of the technology that, that Roger was explaining to us and, and how utilities have been exploring that, uh, you know, what we see in the game world and trying to bring that into, into business applications and, and uh, real, real live purposes. Uh, so some of the pilots that we heard from some of our customers and, and some of the other utilities that we spoke to, uh, the most common has always been about you know location of hidden assets. So how do I how do I find that buried network infrastructure, whether I'm a gas, water, or electric, electric utility, uh, using that to update and, and locate my GIS information. Uh, so certainly that, that was one of the common use cases. We've all seen it at the, the trade shows where they've got that, that uh, photograph or, or that image of buried infrastructure that you can use that 3D image or, or lens to be able to look under the ground and, and, and locate that information. Uh, some of the other use cases that we've seen or heard about is, is certainly around that training tutorial. So how do I take advantage of some of this technology to be able to uh, augment or, or uh, up the skills and the certifications of, of junior workers in the field? So take my more experienced people and be able to connect them virtually with, with junior workers out in the field as well. Uh, we've also heard a lot, there's a lot of convergence between the conversations around augmented virtual and drone technology. So how do I take some of that uh, uh, technology of the, the flight simulation and the images that are coming in from those drones and bring it into a view that I can see from the ground level or back in the office? So that, that's some of the common uh, projects and pilots that, that we've certainly heard. I don't know, Meg, Ed, if you've uh, seen any in your utility that you've been playing with as well? Um. Yeah, I mean, the other part of this that uh, we haven't touched on yet would probably be that IoT section as well. And um, it's probably a, def a different definition for everyone about what IoT is. But I would say, I mean, utilities have a bit of an advantage in this space and, you know, maybe even ahead of the technology curve for a change. Um, but we've had SCADA for uh, quite some time. And, and I would say uh, on the utility side anyways, not on the customer side, um, uh, IoT is probably like SCADA 2.0, so maybe a, a finer... Um, granularity, um, you know, the way we store it is probably different than SCADA. Um, but we've, we've had a couple of um, pilots in, in, in that space. Uh, I would say one notable one is um, um, Schweitzer Electric has a, a new smart fault indicator. And so we're starting to deploy these kind of smaller, cheaper devices that integrate into our SCADA. And I would say maybe that's a, a foray into the IoT space. So that's an example of that. Excellent. So before we get into talking about the results of these pilots, I did want to ask one follow-up question. And Roger, maybe you can help uh, give us some insight. You talked about the differences of these technologies. Now we're talking about the pilots we've seen in this space. Why do you think that these pilots were kind of the starting point for this technology? Why do you think that remote worker assistance, locating assets, and training tutorials really are the, that first step that utilities are taking to explore the, these technologies? Well, the, the technologies of augmented reality and virtual reality have actually been around for a, a long time. They're just now starting to hit the, the forefront of people's conscious as far as what technology is here and what you can actually do with it. So having technology and being able to successfully apply it are not necessarily the same thing. And so now we're starting to get in situations where people say, well, what can I do? If I can actually hold something in front of my face, a smartphone or a tablet, and pan around, and I can see things from a first-person perspective on the ground, you know, can I see where the transformer is, or can, where, can I see where the fuse is, or, or can I see where the underground lines are from where I'm standing? Uh, there's an efficiency gain there, there's a workflow gain improvement there uh, that can translate into an ROI. And the utility space, I think, is one of those that can more, more readily has access to use cases that seem to apply this type of technology, a first-person view of asset information, or a first-person view to configuration data and, and maintenance history and things like that, that maybe certain other industries don't necessarily um, see or can't gain immediate access to. And so uh, I think it just comes down to uh, identifying ways to apply the technology in a way that makes the most sense 
in terms of early stage adoption, um, in terms of what are the effective use cases that give me the most bang for the buck on an ROI point of view. And I think there's also a little bit of um, can I do this cost effectively? You know, what can I do today that, that doesn't require me to, to buy whole new devices for everyone in my entire company? In order to <coughs> and gradually there's a realization that there are parts of this technology that you can apply that doesn't necessarily mean you have to wait five years for a heads-up display or sink $5,000 per employee into a new device necessarily. There are off-the-shelf devices you may already have today that you can leverage effectively to, uh, to see a return on some of these use cases. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I mean, I, I agree with what, uh, what you said there, but I think we forget that in the consumer space, augmented reality has already exploded, right? I mean, this might be an older crowd but um, for, for this, but anyone heard of Pokemon Go? I mean, that's the big augmented reality thing that went crazy for a while there. I probably played it as well. Oh, okay, I've never played it. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot in the consumer space, and so I think uh, you're right. It's, it's finding um, effective uses of pretty mainstream consumer technology now and how can we actually apply that to the to mm -hmm. the utility space to uh, to gain some benefit yeah i think we're approaching an inflection point you know with the advent of next generation microsoft equipment apple doing something that may be resulting in something later on this year or early next year that will result in a little bit of a, a flooding of the market of consumer grade devices and as consumers begin adopting technology it becomes more prevalent obviously additional ways of applying it uh, seeing it percolate into the enterprise space, I think is only going to, to accelerate in terms of adoption. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add one more comment to that, which is um, one thing we're finding from the utility side anyways is as we're starting to get the younger workforce, um, some of these consumer grade experiences are now starting to be expected in the enterprise as well. Uh, and so uh, there's, some, there's, there's that angle of trying to find out, okay, how can we utilize this to make the business work better? Then there's the other uh, side of it from the expectation of the employees or the customers where we almost have to do it at a certain point. Yeah, we always bring our personal life to work with us. So, yeah. you know, all the, the devices that I use at home and, and the experiences that, that uh, give me pleasure in my personal life, mm -hmm. I want to be able to take advantage of those when, when I go to work as well. So let's get back to talking about these use cases for utilities. What kind of results have we seen from some of these early use cases? Carol, do you want to walk us through that? Sure. So, you know, part of, you know, uh, I work for, for a software company. Uh, we support the utility sector, but we, we don't want to innovate necessarily ahead of the adoption rate of our, of our customers so that we have stuff that's just sitting on the shelf. So we're, we've, we've been looking at, you know, what are those those pilots and those use cases that, that utilities have tried? Uh, where can we invest our R&D dollars to accelerate that adoption and uh, really realize a return on investment for, for our customers? And, and we spent a lot of time over the last year you're looking at the pilot results so you know what what's been tried what's failed what what is showing early promises and you know the the chart up here on the slide behind me is just showing that classic Gardner hype cycle so when we see these consumer grade uh, you know toys and technology coming out and we try to bring them into the enterprise we get into that that uh, hype cycle of the inflated expectation of what this is going to do to change our business and change our lives at work and and realize that that great innovative leap forward uh, and then we slowly get into the realities of the situation. I saw a lot of uh, panel sessions and on the main stage over the last couple of days here talking about that. Uh, we're quickly getting to the point of no. Uh, so how do we get to the point of yes or being able to say, yes, this technology is actually going to work in our business? Uh, so we start going down into that slope of disillusionment or that trough of disillusionment. But we are coming into that inflection point that Roger was talking about where we are starting to see some of the, the benefits being realized or use cases starting to emerge of how utilities could take advantage of this today. But some of the, the early pilots and, and results uh, were really working around safety concerns. So if you are in that immersive world or virtual reality where I'm in a, a heads-up display and I'm taking myself out of the physical world, uh, we have disorientation, we've got safety issues, uh, you now have a, a worker out in the field armed with a $5,000 device. Uh, you know, we have people getting mugged for their, their running shoes and sneakers today, so certainly you don't want to put your workers at risk with, with some of these uh, very expensive and uh, distracting technologies. So worker safety has been a big barrier, uh, and that's obviously something that utilities are very concerned with. How do we protect the worker safety, not, not put them at risk? So that became one of the first barriers to adoption that we saw. 
Uh, obviously, privacy concerns. When Google Glass first came out, uh, it was you know worth your life in your hands to be wearing one of those walking into a bar and and being perceived to be filming people in a in a private setting. So certainly, you don't want a worker providing a customer service walking into somebody's home or walking into somebody's private yard and, and look like they're filming or uh, breaching those privacy transactions. So that was certainly an area of the area. And, and Roger mentioned earlier about the, the hardware costs. So it's not been practical prior to this to arm everybody not only with a two or $3,000 mobile device to do their jobs, but now also a $5,000 uh, display or, or heads-up display to uh, put themselves into an augmented or virtual world. So now the, the cost becomes an issue. And we will see that, that cost drive down as, as adoption, but that's the catch-22. Uh, we won't see the cost come down until there's major adoption but we won't have major adoption until the costs come down. So, so hardware cost was an issue. Uh, and you know, one of those use cases that we heard earlier about some of the pilots of using AR, VR to be able to, to locate uh, hidden assets or be able to update your GIS data. Well, if your GIS data is not good enough in the first place, how can then uh, a virtual representation of that against the physical world really be practical? So you know, the quality of our GIS data and the digital twin just, just hasn't been there enough uh, to really uh, mainstream that and, and make it practical today. And then finally, uh, you know, it, it's that around that drone component, uh, not really the AR VR piece of this, but that that convergence of when we talk about AR, drones always come in, or the Internet of Things always come into the conversation as well. Uh, there is a lot of regulations and restrictions around where I can fly my drone, uh, who's who's authorized and has a pilot license or, around that. So that also becomes uh, a lot of the things and the hurdles that we have to overcome before we can bring that into our business. So now that we've talked about some of the barriers, some of the results of these early early pilots, Miguel, maybe you can start us off, and then I'd like to hear, Carol and Roger, your thoughts on this, but really how far away are we from enterprise-wide adoption of these technologies? Like, we definitely are not there right now, but how far away would you say we are? Well, again, I mean, in the consumer space, we're there. Um, so you have Snapchat filters and Pokemon Go and all that kind of stuff. and and so. I would say, um, to some extent, the technology is there today. But how far we are from widespread enterprise adoption, I would say, at least probably the next couple of years, and, and for these reasons that Carol outlined, um, uh, for widespread adoption. So, I mean, the big one for us, or that we're seeing, would be uh, the quality of data that you need to actually um, affect uh, pretty, pretty useful processes or workflows is still not quite there for many utilities. Um, the other thing, uh, I think you mentioned the hardware costs, but I would say even the hardware form factor is a bit of a, uh, an inhibitor right now. So when we're talking about training, um, it's difficult to have, and again, I'm thinking from the utility perspective and the lines perspective, difficult to have a lineman who's uh, in real time holding a tablet and trying to do his work and things like that. So you need kind of a different form factor that's a little bit more fluid. So um, Roger mentioned some of the upcoming technologies, and they look like they're coming in the next year or two, so there's rumors about Apple's AR solution, whatever that is, it's gonna be a big secret. Um, <laughs> HoloLens 2 just got announced and they're starting to take pre-orders. Uh, Magic Leap just put out, I think, their version two. Rogers, you'd, you'd know more about that. Um, so the, tech, the hardware seems to be coming up. Uh, all the phone developers and the major mobile OS developers have put, our, uh, put out uh, AR kit and AR core and things like that. So I would say we're probably a couple years away from finding really useful um, enterprise workflows. And just real quick, Miguel, yeah. Miguel, before we hear from Carol and Roger, something that you said, the form factor, and this is something that's actually been brought up from in other conversations at ETS, it's this idea of design. How are you thinking about the way that your employees are engaging with this technology? If they can't hold it and take it where they need to go, then it's not going to be effective, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the same story as any piece of technology, which is, I think you were saying this earlier, you want the technology to disappear and for it just to be fluid and natural, and, and, and that plays into form factor. Um, I, I would say, uh, just kind of touching back on some of the things you guys said, that uh, probably from a, a utility person's perspective, from what we can see today, probably one of the earliest use cases, one of the earliest enterprise workflows that I can see this being deployed in would be uh, locating underground assets. So I don't think we're going to get to a point in the short term where you can just do away with uh, locators entirely, 
but as an aid to, to as a first step to find out where your underground assets are so you can start just you know painting lines for a call before you dig type programs I, I can see that as a real valuable use case uh, in the near future mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're probably going to have a bunch of different answers here in terms of, yes, I would agree with, with Maged that, uh, you know, the technology is there today uh, for mainstream adoption. Uh, there's some barriers that we need to overcome. Uh, you know, I, I look at, you know, as a software developer, we're, we're looking at how we can bridge the gap to widespread adoption. So how can we help accelerate with the tools and the technology that the utility worker already has in their hands today uh, to, to make that transition easier and, and accelerate that adoption? Uh, so I, I believe there's, there's tools and technology that we can use and deploy into the utility today. And we're probably about three to five years away from some of the peripheral devices, whether it's uh, a Google Glass or a HoloLens or uh, the, the embedded AR kits that are coming out in the devices that we already have that, that will help build on that bridging technology. So I, I think we can start making that journey today uh, and, and get faster and better. And uh, I don't know how many Netflix fans there are in the audience, but if anyone's watched uh, Black Mirror, uh, eventually we're all going to have the uh, AR embedded in our in our eyeballs and our retinas, so you know that that will seamlessly have that technology disappear. But uh, I'm not sure if we're we're quite ready for that brave new world yet. Yeah. And just one quick response: I would agree with that. I wasn't. I was thinking of like ubiquitous, kind of you know, widespread Absolutely. adoption. But I agree yeah. that there are some use cases today, uh, given that we have some data and things to back it up. Absolutely. Obviously, I'm a little biased because my company is all about AR and VR. But <laughs> ultimately, I think it will be a ubiquitous technology. Uh, the same way that smartphones are now pretty much ubiquitous. Eventually everyone will have some type of device that they may not wear permanently, but you will have glasses or some form of device that you'll be leveraging. And that may seem a totally alien foreign concept to people in the room, but I guarantee you 10 years ago smartphones would have seemed like science fiction as well. Yeah. It is something that will eventually happen. Well, if we've ever walked into a, a grocery store or, or really any public space now, all the doors that automatically open for you, um, if some of you are as old as I am, the first time you ever saw that uh, was on a science fiction TV called Star Trek, uh, where you, know, you walked onto the, the, the bridge of the Enterprise and the doors whoosh, opened and whoosh, closed. And uh, we, you know that, that science fiction becomes science fact sooner than we think. So. And, and for the naysayers in the room, uh, I'll remind you, when the iPhone first came out, the then CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, laughed and said, who's going to buy a thousand dollar device and put it in their pocket? <laughs> yeah. And, and look what happened, and right? Now we've got three of them. That's you know? right, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I actually was first asked the question about how long, how many years will it be before there's adoption in 1995. Uh, there's, a, there's a picture of me in 1995 standing with, with glasses, heads up display on my head, and I, I totally hacked a uh, Nintendo Power Glove. You, know, making you were the first cyborg. Gestures, yeah. uh, and my answer then was the same: three to five years. So you know, here we are. Um, I think that the, the the difference now versus then is everyone has a supercomputer in your pocket. Uh, everyone has a device that can essentially handle the computational demands the technology brings to the table, and you have very large companies placing very large bets on investing and improving that technology because they all want to own the next device that you put on your head that maybe replaces the device that's in your pocket today. So I do think that uh, it is a reality to say that in, in a few short years, um, you'll be seeing more and more things, more and more devices appear and more and more adoption of the technology. Five years ago, you go on Google Play Store and iTunes and how many augmented reality applications or games were there? You could probably count them on a couple of hands. Uh, today, you go on there and there'll be hundreds, literally hundreds. And so that's what's happened in just a very short period of time. And ultimately, that carries its way over into, into mainstream and that carries its way over into enterprise. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of coming outside of the, the mainstream of the, the topic of our discussion, but, you know, technology wearables and injectables are here today. So, you know, being able to put uh, biometrics in, inside for diabetes maintenance and, and cancer treatment and targeted uh, medical research programs, it, it's here today. So we, we are uh, integrating uh, digital technology in, into our, our bodies and into our, our mainstream life. Uh, so I, I agree. They... The, the future is now, it's going to come faster and faster. Uh, they do say that the uh, rate of innovation uh, accelerates. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, we weren't talking about going to Mars, but we certainly are having those conversations today. Right? 
So I think we've established that, at least from the con consumer's perspective, the technology is here, but now it's about getting it adopted. How, do you, how can utilities accelerate the adoption of this technology and realize business value? Because that's the other tricky part. Mm -hmm. You can say, use this and do this, but you have to be able to communicate a real business value on the investment in this technology. So Carol, how, right. can, how can they do that? How can utilities do that? Yeah, and that, and that kind of goes back to that that bridging technology that that I was talking about earlier. And, and like I'm in in sort of the same boat that Roger is. You know, we're we're in the the business of selling software to utilities. So uh, we're not going to make any sales of, of this technology if there isn't a business case and a real ROI at the end of it. You know, there's going to be a lot of conversations. Everybody's interested in where this is going, but uh, there, there's no real traction or progress made. So, so as Clevest, what we've been looking at is uh, we're essentially a mobile workforce management company. So we arm uh, the mobile workers with software and technology to, to do their, their jobs, whether it's uh, asset management and maintenance or providing digital maps in, in their, their mobile devices that they have or customer service work. So we looked at the AR world through that lens. So how, how could we provide uh, an AR overlay into the work that they're already doing on the device that they already have? Uh, and that's that's the approach that we've been taking. So looking at uh, you know some of these practical applications, how can we leverage uh, the device that I already have, whether it's a smartphone or a smart tablet or any device that has a GPS technology embedded in it and a camera, uh, to be able to augment my first person view, the asset that I'm looking at, with what I've got in my digital twin and my GIS data. Uh, and then being able to uh, start to eliminate that, uh, that technology barrier from, from me interacting with, with the real world and the virtual world. So being able to recognize an asset that I'm standing in front of and looking at and be able to bring down the attribution, uh, so the, the date and the year that it went into production, uh, the, the makeup and material uh, of that asset, for not only locating hidden assets, but also updating and validating my GIS data. So getting better GIS information uh, into my digital twin. We also started looking at, uh, at components of, you know, what am I already doing with a 2D map? So a GIS uh, map and model that is a, a flat layer that I'm interacting with symbology and iconology for my GIS data, being able to do that same work but in a 3D model. So how could I be able to take uh, the augmented reality overlay and run a network trace to see uh, upstream isolation points and downstream connected customers, uh, but, but be able to visualize that and follow that trace and actually see the, the homes that are lit up uh, uh, and connected uh, to that. So if I was going to take a line out of service, who's going to be impacted by that? So I don't now have to interpret a map or interpret symbology and iconology. I can see it in the real world. Uh, so being, you know, a little bit more seamless or uh, removing that technical barrier and also helping with new workers that are coming online. You don't have to teach them what your GIS data means. You can, you can visualize it in the real world. We also looked at, um, you know, we have a lot of customers, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you in the, in the audience here are SAP customers as well. So how can we make our workers more safe by being able to look around through the camera lens uh, at a neighborhood that I'm working in and see pending work notifications? So being able to draw that information down that's already on my mobile device, but instead of having to search for it, I can now just view it uh, in, in a, a real world view. Uh, and we talked a little bit earlier about that impracticality of, you know, constantly doing my work through uh, the arms up instead of the heads up display through my camera lens. Uh, some of the things that EDX and Clevis have been working on is how do I be able to view that augmented uh, and real world, lock the screen and bring it down so I can now interact with my augmented reality overlay, but in a more natural position where I'm, I'm now just working on my tablet and I don't have to be running around uh, the neighborhood with my arms up in the air all the time looking like I'm getting mugged. <laughs> Uh, so the, the other kind of components that we looked at around worker safety is, you know, we have a lot of information in workforce management systems today about uh, angry customers, disconnects, um, you know, incidents and in police uh, involvement or bad dogs, the classic bad dog in the, in the neighborhood of the yard. Being able to visualize that again without having to search for it 
or have that information buried in a work order and being able to just pan the neighborhood and if I'm working at one duplex or half of the duplex knowing that there's a bad dog loose in the yard at a home next door that's not necessarily in the work order I was dispatched to do but I can now see that in the real world view again keeping our workers more safe and informed in, in, in the field without having to do a lot of data entry and, and searching for that information. Uh, so some of the other uh, components, this is, this is obviously that, uh, that big win that we think in terms of the return on investment for a utility. But how do we uh, arm, we've all been talking about the aging workforce and, and uh, the, the fact that you've got people retiring out with a lot of knowledge in their heads about both your business operations but also uh, some of your technology, software and tools that they're using. So how do I help my junior workers coming on board be more safe, effective and productive in the field? Uh, remote worker assist is another great use of AR technology where we can either provide, uh, you know, as, as Maged and I were talking about earlier, standing op standard operating procedures in terms of I'm about to perform a meter exchange or I'm about to uh, isolate a line or, or uh, do some, some work on the electric grid, being able to run through a standard operating procedure in, in an augmented reality view or connect with an expert either in the office or a supervisor somewhere else in the field, being able to share views. So what am I seeing and what am I about to do? Share that information with my remote uh, senior person that can then interact with and, and draw and annotate on, on the screen that I'm seeing so I can see what he's seeing, he can see what I'm seeing and provide a little bit of that remote assist to make uh, the utility operations more efficient and cost effective. You don't necessarily have to run that expert out uh, to the location, they, they can help uh, in a remote manner. And finally, we were looking at uh, you know, visual planning. So before you go out and extend uh, you know, construction into a new cul-de-sac, you know, we all get all, all upset when we've got that pad mountain transformer in the middle of my landscaping in, in a new yard. Uh, in a new subdivision. So being able to see how your utility assets are going to lay into the community uh, and visualize that so you don't have those expensive, uh, go out and do all the construction then somebody complains and you have to move, move poles and, and, and move asset infrastructure around after the fact. Uh, so being able to see how it's going to sit into the community uh, I, I think may be an, also a really good use case. So can I jump in with, um, so a lot of use cases there and, and I'll tell you which ones from a utility perspective kind of excite us uh, in that as a subset if you don't think. I, I appreciate the input. Okay, very good. Um, so one of the things, so the, the group that I uh, run is the innovation and OT group and, and one of the issues we have and I'm sure any technology people have similar issues is that we come up with these great ideas that are brilliant um, but then when we take them to the field guys they slap us on the hand and they say we don't like it. Um, and, and often it's not that it's a bad idea, I was being facetious about the brilliant part, it's just that um, I think often the technology people, we see something that can be done better, but we heard this morning, if you're not actually solving an existing problem, it's a harder sell. Um, so, so I'm zeroing in on some of the existing problems that we, we would have that this technology could solve. Um, the SOP one I really like, we were talking about that, because I think one of the tenants, correct me if I'm wrong here, but one of the tenants of AR is also that the the computer recognizes the physical world around you. So it understands that this is a table and you can put stuff on the table uh, or the floor or somewhat. Uh, so when you're talking about an SOP and the difference between reading it on a two-dimensional sheet of paper and seeing it on in, in the three-dimensional world that you're actually working on, that's something that I think uh, field folks can actually latch onto and really get excited about and get some real practical use from, especially some of the novice ones. Mm -hmm. It's seeing it done in front of you or seeing what needs to be done in front of you. I think that's pretty exciting. Um, the, other, the other complaint we get a lot or, or um, room for improvement area that we get a lot from field uh, folks is uh, they are using these devices. We've finally gotten them off paper and onto tablets and whatever to, to input data. But uh, especially in Canada, but everywhere, because they're wearing uh, PPE and things like that, they don't want to keep taking their gloves on and off. It's hard to operate these things in a practical uh, way. And so the more you can get them away from having to uh, physically interact with that machine that they're holding, uh, the better. So the mm -hmm. use case of being able to uh, interrogate your data without actually having to do anything is a pretty big, uh, is a valuable thing, I would say, for field folks. So for example, if I want to know um, uh, I'm coming up with this on the top, off the top of my head, but say uh, in, our, in our service area, if you're 
uh, replacing um, a device, we actually label neighboring devices uh, on the device. So if we have a transformer, they actually write the, the number of the neighboring device on the elbows of the transformer so you can effectively trace it. Um, that's a difficult thing. In the middle of the night, it's raining or something and they're changing something out and they need to change asset numbers. If you could just hold it up and, and you know, look over there and say, oh, there's the neighboring device and actually see it, there's, there's some pretty uh, added value there. Mm -hmm. um, I had a third example, but I've forgotten it now, so <laughs> Yeah, and I, I've certainly heard that example of, you know, it's, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, I get called out, uh, it's a major event or storm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm having to take out a, a line or a neighborhood, and, and now I'm having to, in the dark, uh, try yeah. to interrogate or, or see that, that small label uh, that's put on that device, but being able to use a, a lit up screen uh, mm -hmm. to be able to visualize with a lit up augmented reality overlay where that isolation point is or where those connected customers are, uh, hu huge value, yep. you know, instead of having to pull off the gloves, try to remember how to, you know, in input the starting point and run a trace. Mm -hmm. As a novice worker, I mean, I, I wouldn't know how to do that yep. you know, at three in the morning or two in the morning. And that is something that would be available today uh, with the data. Uh, maybe not the SOP thing, I don't know, mm -hmm. that might need a little bit of work, but the uh, uh, interrogating data, I think that's something yeah. that's today. And, and one more thing, when we're talking about interrogating data, I think going back into the system as well, being able to use AR uh, and combine that with things like machine vision uh, or whatever other catchy AI phrase you want to throw out there um, to input data into the system. So for example, instead of typing in an asset serial number as you're installing it, if you can just point this, the camera at something and it reads all the nameplate information, um, you know, there's huge mm -hmm. value in that. And that's, you know, somewhat related to AR recognizing the physical world. Yeah. <laughs> so, Miguel, you brought up challenges, and challenges really just present opportunities for learning. So what have we learned from this first wave of pilots and innovation that will help mm -hmm. utilities kind of structure this long-term strategy to really drive adoption of this technology? Because we know it's not, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and then all of a sudden you'll have VR fully deployed across your enterprise. It's going to be a curve and a, a long-term play. So what have we learned? I guess two things would come to mind. Um, so utilities, uh, especially up where we're heavily regulated, uh, I'm, we're from Canada, a utility in Canada, and we're pretty slow to jump on new technology. And I would say there's good reason for that, and we all know those reasons. I mean, um, we're effectively uh, delivering an essential service, sometimes in regulated monopoly scenarios, uh, with uh, customers who may be low income, as we've heard, maybe. Uh, uh, you know, fixed income or however it is. So we can't afford to waste money and we should feel guilty, <laughs> I think, with every penny we're spending because mm -hmm. this is, you know, people's livelihood at stake in some cases. Um, but I think what we've learned from some of these pilots is that it may be worthwhile, in this scenario at least, to kind of dip your toes in the water with some of this emerging technology um, because, uh, it one, it... it um, you start to find out what it's all about, you get past the hype and you understand how you can use it practically in your utility. So it's not a bad thing to do a pilot and two, it, it helps you prepare. So that's the second thing I think we've learned is what we need to do to prepare for this. And fortunately for utilities, I think there's a real convergence of, of all the things we have to do to prepare for all these new emerging technologies. So AR and VR, uh, machine vision, uh, IOT, we haven't talked too much about that, but there's there's kind of a common theme of what we have to do to get ready for them, uh, from my perspective, and a lot of that is, is this idea of uh, the digital twin. It's all about data. So when you start talking about AR, when you start talking about machine vision and AI and predictive analytics and all this stuff, it's all about having the data in place. And so the good news is that we can, I think, utilities can invest in that stuff today and know that your investment is actually going to pan out in a couple of years, whether it's one year or five years, whenever this stuff comes out, there's a whole bunch of use cases that all need the same thing, and that's kind of a digital twin, as they've been saying uh, this week, uh, of, your, of your assets or of your network or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I would say those are the two takeaways that uh, we, we need to get ready. <laughs> Yeah, and I would just add to Maged's, you know, we, we often talk about the cautious utility, 
uh, I, I, as a consumer of electric gas and water, appreciate that because I, I like the lights to, to come on when I flick the switch as well. So we don't necessarily want to innovate uh, at the risk of the reliability of, of the, the distribution and, and uh, consumption of the energy that we all rely on to heat our homes and, and light our way. Uh, but there, there is an opportunity today to take some of this technology and use it to improve your operations and be a good fiduciary student or, or a, a, a steward of that money that you either get from your investors as an IOU or from your members as a cooperative and, and make sure that you are moving to that, that clean, reliable energy that we're all talking about at the conference today. So I've had my chance to ask the panelists my questions. Do we have any questions in the audience for the panel? I'm thinking about what are the prerequisites to all this. So to take advantage of these technologies, can you speak to, you know, and some, assuming some of the obvious ones are your data has to be right. If you want to digitize an SOP, you have to have an SOP. <laughs> uh, so what's the, it feels like there's a ton of preparation to take advantage. Can you speak to some of that? Yeah, I can certainly start uh, with that and then feel free to, to jump in where, where I take us down a, a rat hole or, or a, a wrong path. So uh, absolutely, and, and Maged talked earlier about, you know, there's a lot of use cases that we went through here uh, that Clevis has been looking at uh, because there, there is uh, some prerequisites going in. Uh, so some of the early pilot results we saw uh, disappointing results from uh, locating hidden or underground assets. That return on that investment isn't there because if the GIS data that you already have is not reliable enough within you know an inches of accuracy you still have to go back and doing the traditional locates to make sure that you aren't you know going down a path of digging up the street and accidentally breaking a water main or a line or, or a gas line uh, so so some prerequisites one of the reasons that we've looked at all the different use cases we have is depending on where the utility is in terms of their digital journey uh, there's a variety of use cases so uh, we looked at the worker safety information. So if you have customer information systems integrated into your workforce management systems, which majority of our, our customers do, we're connected to either the SAP system or uh, you know, Banner or Hanson or some of the other CIS systems out there, where the data is already flowing into your workforce management system. We know where the bad customers are. We know where the bad dogs are. So being able to visualize that doesn't require anything more than the worker's location. So, and we already know that as well if he's holding a GPS enabled device. So being able to, to visualize that with the technology that's already available from uh, the orientation of where I'm standing and where I'm looking, that technology exists today, the utilities can take advantage of that. Uh, the standard operating procedures, yes, uh, that, that has to be created in terms of both documenting but also then creating a, you know, a, a video tutorial or even just being able to, to bring that document out, but it has to be documented in some manner. Uh, other, other than that, we're trying to look at a, a broad range of use cases. The remote worker assist would have no prerequisite at all other than a SME that we could connect that, that junior worker to, so somebody being available to take that call on demand. I would add um, or second some of that, I guess. Um, SOPs, yeah, I agree. You should probably have them anyways, with or without <laughs> AR. Um, but uh, for us, the, the one thing we've been focusing on the most that we've lacked, and I think uh, many of the utilities be in the same boat, is going to be your GIS data, um, as well as um, some sort of three-dimensional capture of your data as well. So we've been trying things with LiDAR and photogrammetry to try to get three-dimensional um, versions of our data, our GIS data as well. I, that's where we've been going to try to prepare for not just that, but all the other things I was talking about, machine vision, and, um, whatever else, uh, predictive analytics, for example. And, and I think there are other use cases for building those models. So for example, vegetation management um, and, and other such use cases. So for us, it would be GIS data and three-dimensional information of your, especially overhead system, but even capturing, um, you know, trenching and duct bank information and things like that, which is GIS, effectively. I think that's where you get the strongest bang for your buck, and it's something that you should probably do anyways. Yes. Uh, Marvin from CPS Energy, work on the innovation side. So, how would you convince your C suite to do such kind of projects? And um, if you have uh, successfully convinced, you were to do a pilot, how much time you spend on these? <laughs> 
Yeah, I can start and then sure. uh, maybe Maged can put a practical application on it from the utilities perspective. So, so Clevest is actively looking at some of these use cases. We've partnered and, and built a prototype of, of what this could look like around the use cases. We're actually showing it here at, at ETS this year. Uh, so, you know, what we're looking for is utility partners. So, you know, we can, we can conceptualize and look at some of these use cases that we think would have a good return on investment uh, to help build a business case for why you would pilot this and roll it out. Uh, so really looking for a vendor to pilot with uh, or, or partner with and, and run a pilot is one way to cost effectively, you know, trial this in your, in your environment without a broad rollout if, if you don't want to do the big bang approach. Uh, and pick a use case that is going to give you a real return on investment. So where, like Maged was saying earlier, what pain points do you have? So it's, it's great to talk about the, you know, the, the exciting world of AR, VR, but it's really hard to convince your C-suite to invest dollars, conservative dollars, either from your investor or your members, uh, in, in that technology if there's not a proven return. So look for a pain point, a particular use case that you can get real results and real returns on, and then expand from there. Yeah, I guess one practical example we have, um, and I'll, I'll preface it with it failed, but it was still, it was still something there is we no tried. There no failure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you had a learning. Um, what, what we wanted to do was, this was quite a few years ago, we, we had a reason to want a UAV. I say UAV and not drone because it's got negative connotations with drone. But, um, and so we had a bunch of uh, possible use cases, but we knew that a lot of them were long shots. We weren't sure exactly how it was going to work. Uh, and the way we sold it was uh, basically that. We just said, look, you can do uh, vegetation management. You can do um, damage assessment. We have a lot of islands, like not, not uh, uh, network islands, but actual geographical islands in our service area. Um, we said you could do damage, quick damage assessment. You can do infrared scanning if you attach an IR camera. Uh, all sorts of things. We think <laughs> uh, we'd like to try it out. And so we took that approach and we partnered with actually uh, a couple of different uh, commercial entities that had some experience with piloting and could navigate regulation and things like that. And so we went down that way and we determined at the time, uh, and this was again a few years ago and we did it for a couple of years, that it, the technology and the regulation weren't there yet at the time. Um, and so we're trying other things. But that was our strategy is to find, basically throw a wide net out and one of them is gonna stick. <laughs> I would probably also say to, to look at what your current equipment base is now. What are your people using in the field or at their desktop? What's the device that they have, if they have one? And then use that as a starting point. So that, that sidesteps the issue of, hey, I need to buy a whole new equipment for my, for my people. So you can set that aside and table it as a future thought and focus on what's the current devices and what can I do with those current devices. And that will lead you into these use cases, into the, the ROI. It's a little, probably a little more palatable than walking in by saying, okay, Wonder. step $10 one, $10. we're going to buy everybody a new device. Um, yeah. So you can, you can take that hardware component out today and focus on what are the meaningful use cases you can do with your existing equipment. That's probably a good place to start. Are we done? Yeah, that closes okay, us out. It. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful conversation.